methods for suspending matter in a distance from the sound source to produce standing waves as per this apparatus and setup. An instantaneous view of a single travelling sound wave will take the form of a sine wave. The motion relationship distance equals velocity times time 
is a key to the basic wave relationship. With the wavelength as distance, this relationship becomes lambda equals vt. Then using f equals 1 on t gives a standard wave relationship of the wave property frequencies, wavelength and propagation velocity. This is a general wave relationship which applies to sound and light waves, other electromagnetic waves and waves in mechanical media. In this type of device, intense sound waves of the correct frequency must be employed to create the desired standing wave. Any frequency can produce non-linear effects at the right volumes and can use sonic waves in the audible range from 16 kHz to 20 kHz. These are frequencies that the human ear can detect or ultrasonic waves 20 kHz to 1000 MHz. By comparison, electromagnetic radiation termed microwave generally refers to alternating current signals with frequencies from 0.3 GHz. This levitates a single or a group of spherical polystyrene, a plastic trigonal prism or even a small cylinder. The resonant frequency can be shifted by the diameter of the vibrating plate in two nodal modes and a narrow directional pattern is obtained on the central axis of the produced field. A distance between the sound source or transducer and the reflective surface must be maintained multiple of half of the wavelength of the sound the transducer produces. This produces a wave with stable nodes and antinodes. The next configuration of a single axis levitator incorporates a reflector that essentially acts as a small independent source of sound waves which strike a reflector and are reflected. The sound waves pass through each other. The localized interference sound waves produce acoustic energy wells in which objects are levitated independent of resonance or standing waves. The size of the reflector is sufficiently small in this case relative to the sound field such that the reflected waves are quickly scattered and dissipated to substantially prevent any resonance. It may be seen that when the apparatus is activated, any desired object may be suspended or acoustically levitated at a given position or positions above the reflector. And as shown, this can even levitate a small rock. Liquid can also be levitated. The liquid must have a suitable bond number, a ratio that describes the liquid's surface tension, density and size in a context of gravity and the surrounding fluid. If the bond number is too low, the drop will burst. We can also use this method to combine two levitated liquid drops, which are significantly ruptured when a characteristic size was reached. The two reflectors having respective levitated drops may be moved together until the drops combine, and one of the reflectors may be moved away or rotated out of position, whereby the combined drop will be levitated under a single reflector. This arrangement can make droplets dance, float and bounce above a surface keeping small amounts of fluid free of contamination. The intensity of the sound must also not overwhelm the surface tension of the liquid droplets. If the sound field is too intense, the drop will flatten into a donut and then burst. Another type of acoustic levitation device uses resonant cavities such as an acrylic glass tank to create a large acoustic field. This type of device can have one or more sound sources that are connected to a chamber in which a reflective wall opposes a sound source. The one shown is a plexiglass acoustic levitation chamber of 300 mm cube, referred to as a Helmholtz resonant cavity. Researchers continue to develop new setups for levitation systems such as these. Using a single axis levitator with an ultrasound emitter with a concave surface for both drive and reflector where a significant factor of four enhancement in levitation force is obtained. This sound pressure field setup produced approximately 20 millimeter wavelength sounds which would enable objects half the wavelength or less to be levitated. It is impossible to levitate small live animals and insects such as ants, spiders, ladybugs, beetles and even a fish. In the previous method 15a, I demonstrated how photonic radiation pressure could be used for propulsion and levitation, which utilized photon pressure of intense 
electromagnetic radiation from the sun for solar sailing as well as a solar wind pressure using electric I also discussed ablative devices that can use a laser in Earth orbit to propel space vehicles. Some of the methods proposed pose monumental engineering challenges. A potentially easier approach may be to use electromagnetic radiation and convert it into propulsive thrust. Electromagnetic wave conversion propulsion mythology can be achieved mechanically or electrically and can be broken down further into three subdivisions. Type A direct mechanical conversion, B electrical conversion, and C mechanical pressure electric conversion. Type A direct mechanical conversion example include solar thermal rockets, which can make use of solar power to directly heat reaction mass, and therefore does not require an electric generator as most other forms of solar powered propulsion do. Type C mechanical pressure electric conversion propulsion has already been described in method 15A but grouped here as well because the electrical energy required for laser propulsion can be converted from solar cells or other devices in space. Masers could also be used to power a painted conventional solar sail with a layer of for short. For the purpose of this exercise, which is to demonstrate the state of our current wireless transmission art, I'll start at the opposite right-hand end of the visible spectrum in the long wave radio band, which is below the AM broadcast band defined today as LF or low frequency range. This is a very simple essentially forming a transformer. Continuing on from the right and towards the visible light spectrum, we now move from LF to MF, the medium frequency band, which is slightly higher than the medium wave 
MW radio band and within the short wave region a frequency of approximately 2.2 MHz. This small Tesla coil is a fairly typical air coil design. It's powered by a primary high voltage source of 5000 volts RMS at only 15 watts. Contains some high voltage capacitors and a quench spar gap, which self oscillates the prime circuit at a rate that equals the operating frequency required to excite the LC inductance capacitance tank circuit. With periodic bursts of high frequency current, the multiple layer primary helical coil is tuned to resonate at the same frequency as the primary LC circuit. The secondary elevated helical coil has a wire winding that is approximately a quarter of a full wavelength long based on the velocity of propagation of the disturbance through the coil itself and the oscillation rate of the circuit designed to be used where the break rate equals the operating frequency. The wavelength of a wave is the distance from one peak or trough to the next. At a quarter wavelength the amplitude of a wave is at its maximum height allowing the connected terminal capacitance or top load sphere to radiate close to this peak where the highest potential coincides with the elevated top load terminal. The terminal capacitance forms one plate of a capacitor. Its impedance matched with free space in order to attain the best results and the ground or earth becomes the other plate and is capable of continuous wave oscillation of non-radiating electromagnetic field energy. An example of a system designed by Tesla for wireless power transmission and reception. The Tesla coil easily lights any low pressure light sources such as fluorescent and incandescent lamps which become plasma balls when held in the vicinity of the top load terminal effectively a secondary capacitor in free space and provides higher current than any other source capable of very high voltages such as a Van de Graaff generator which as it turns out is also very closely related to the Tesla coil and can be considered an AC solid state version of the DC Van de Graaff generator. Shown here the 15 watt output is capable of illuminating a 240 volt 15 watt GLS lamp between the top load terminal sphere and my body. This is 62 and a half milliamps.
space experiments show rudimentary experiments in miniature what Tesla tried to achieve on a world scale. In the final part of 15, part 15C, I will continue on from 2.2 MHz all the way up to the visible light spectrum, where I will demonstrate and discuss mythology that we can use to convert electromagnetic waves from the invisible 17.7 MHz using a valve Tesla coil, 27 MHz CB band, 477 MHz UHF CB band, and 2.5 gigahertz microwave band all the way up to the visible electromagnetic spectrum using polychromatic and monochromatic light sources such as lasers into electrical propulsive thrust using propellers ion to electric plasma propulsion. In the previous method 14, I demonstrated how sound waves can be used to create levitation where I also mentioned that the general wave relationship which applies to sound also applies to light waves and other electromagnetic waves and waves in mechanical media. Method 15 is based on using electromagnetic energy and its derivatives not only to levitate objects 
but also to provide useful propulsion. A star such as our Sun is our most abundant power source and provides light energy in many forms of electromagnetic radiation from the visible to the invisible that can not only be utilized to power or drive craft within our planet, but can also take us or our probes to the outreaches of our solar system as well as other stars. The methodology I will discuss can be broken into two general subdivisions. On the left, photonic or solar derived mechanical pressure propulsion and on the right, electromagnetic wave conversion propulsion. Photonic or solar derived mechanical pressure propulsion can generally describe methods such as solar sails, magnetic or electrical sailing, optical traps, optical suspension or optical tweezers and ablative laser or maser propulsion. Electromagnetic wave conversion propulsion is based on converting energy into a useful form that provides propulsion or lift. Solar or man-made energy can power a laser and drive ablative devices based on mechanical pressure, as well as iron propulsion devices, plasma drives and motor-driven propellers. Many of the methods possible will be a combination of the many other methods previously shown. I will firstly describe and demonstrate methods involving mechanical pressure from photonic sources including our sun and artificial sources. It is well known that radiation can exert a force. The solar wind for example is caused by sunlight blowing away microscopic dust particles and its force on a sun bather has been calculated to approximately equal the weight of a fly. The Crookes radiometer also known as the light mill consists of an airtight glass bulb containing a partial vacuum. Inside are a set of vanes which are mounted on a spindle. The vanes rotate when exposed to light with faster rotation for more intense light providing a quantitative measurement of electromagnetic radiation intensity. When the Crookes radiometer was energy E equals the momentum P multiplied by the speed of light and hence light reflected from a surface exerts a small amount of radiation pressure when a photon is reflected by a solar soil. A photon undergoes a Doppler shift where its wavelength increases.
will allow the craft to achieve escape velocity by repeatedly passing over Earth's magnetic poles. In a similar way, we could also propel from the solar wind with large coiled wire loops that will extend the field as opposed to a smaller coil that concentrates the magnetic field. In another embodiment, a superconductive loop would extend the field even further. Refer method 7 diamagnetic superconducting Meissner effect and would actually have a better thrust to mass ratio than a conventional solar sail because protons of the solar wind carry much more momentum than photons. Light sails could also be driven by a laser, a maser or other beams of light from Earth to push a sail. This is beam powered propulsion using a direct impulse beam. The thrust vector or spatial vector would therefore be away from the sun and towards the target and would achieve a significant fraction of the speed of light velocity. Ram jets are promising but have serious drawbacks. The ram scoop needs to be hundreds of kilometers in diameter to collect enough hydrogen and a power source for the magnetic field that captures it. Some refinements proposed include laser assistance from laser in Earth orbit that would provide the energy to heat the hydrogen flowing into the reactor. Laser light can also be used in other ways for levitating objects or creating thrust in a number of methods. This depiction from Star Trek is not too far from the truth based on the amount of energy you have at your disposal. Success has been achieved using a radiation pressure gradient to levitate microscale particles in air for as long as four hours. Optical levitation can use laser light in a similar way, whereby a material is levitated against the downward force of gravity by an upward force stemming from photon momentum transfer. Typically, photon radiation pressure of a vertical upward directed and focused laser beam of enough intensity counters the downward force of gravity to allow for a stable optical trap. Essentially, a felt tip marker is briefly burnt just above the focal point of a 100 to 250 milliwatt 650 nanometer laser with a collimating lens, releasing a small particle. The bright dot you can see at the intersection of the focused laser is an actual particle embedded in the laser beam. Levitation of 10 and 13.8 micron diameter polystyrene spheres has been achieved, as well as the levitation of 10 and 100 micron diameter glass spheres. Particles can be raised and lowered. A small amount of success has also been achieved translating particles horizontally as well as trapping of multiple particles in one laser beam. Optical tweezers utilizing a similar method are capable of holding small particles in suspension. Micrometer sized from several to 50 micrometer diameter transparent dielectric spheres such as fused silica spheres, oil or water droplets are used in this type of experiment. Pulse plasma propulsion utilizes a high energy pulse focus in the gas or on a solid surface surrounded by gas produces a breakdown which is usually air. This causes an expanding shock wave which absorbs laser energy at the shock front where a laser sustained detonation wave or LSD front for short creates an expansion of the hot plasma behind the shock front during and after the laser pulse that transmits momentum to the craft. Pulse plasma propulsion using air as a working fluid is the simplest form of air breathing laser propulsion. Ablative laser propulsion systems can also transfer momentum to a spacecraft in two different ways. The first way is that photon radiation pressure drives the momentum transfer. The principle behind the propulsion of solar sails and laser sails as previously discussed. A second way of driving momentum transfer to a spacecraft is commonly proposed using a laser to help expel mass from the spacecraft as in a conventional rocket. The second class of propulsion systems are fundamentally limited in their final spacecraft velocities by the rocket equation. Ablative laser propulsion or ALP is yet another form of beam powered propulsion in which an external pulse or continuous laser is used to burn off a plasma plume 
from a solid metal propellant, producing thrusts shown dramatically in these experiments. Unlike the light craft previously shown, which uses air as a propellant, this type of ALP craft can be used in space. The second method of anti-gravity is that of iron propulsion. As with our ping pong ball, thousands of surrounding air molecules around the point of very great curvature, such as a needle or thin wire, loses its charge very quickly. The very strong electric field in the vicinity of a conductor of great curvature can itself lead to ionization of the air. Motion can be obtained via this reactionary effect of a volume of air being accelerated by an electric charge, grit or grits. Maximum thrust moving as much air as fast as possible in a given time. The ion with the opposite sign to that of a conductor of great curvature will be attracted to it causing secondary ionization which will decrease the reactionary effect of thrust due to a reversal of direction of the now oppositely charged particles which will also neutralize those of similar signs will be strongly repelled. Such a concentration of charge can give rise to a wind as the repelled ions stream away, causing an upward lift. Such an electric wind can be seen by the disturbance of a candle flame or a crude device with a single wire emitter where the objective is to move as much mass as possible at a low velocity or energy where the maximum amount of elastic collisions take place with a minimum of destructive molecular dissociation and secondary ionization causing an upward lift of the device.
Next model is one of a multi-grid network with a far superior performance to that of the previous. What we have here is the ion drive floating device, which as you can see there, it's operating off um, 7 volts at um, less than half an hour, which uh, makes it the most efficient flying device that we know of today, consuming less than 3.5 watts, which is less than a uh, indicator light load.
third method, that of producing artificial gravity or vacuum polarization. In our previous iron propulsion model, we were able to utilize the oxygen molecules in the surrounding air to produce a concentration of charge that in turn produced an electric wind as propelled ions streamed away. We can also achieve a similar feat within a solid object that cause a slight coherence of the vacuum fluctuations which alter the inertial properties of an object and its effects on Earth's gravity. This is called vacuum polarization. To understand what occurs requires an understanding on the quantum level. Maxwell's equations only constitute a complete theoretical basis for all macroscopic electrodynamics at an engineering level. It is implied that quantum vacuum effects do not relate to engineered systems. Yet there is only one electrodynamics, and to totally engineer it requires an understanding at its basis. Modern quantum physics believes in the existence of zero-point vacuum energy. Empty space is not empty. It consists of fluctuations of electricity whose densities are in the order of 10 to the 94 grams per centimeter cube. An enormous number. This energy, once called the ether, normally is unobservable since it cancels itself out by destructive interference. However, if a device could induce just a slight coherence over a large region of space in the macroscopic world, then it could produce artificial gravity, which only requires the mass equivalent energy of 10 to the 12 grams required for levitation. It is so much smaller than the 10 to the 94 grams per centimetre cube energy density of empty space. Simply naming a force such as gravity, inertia, momentum, etc., does not describe its cause, but helps describe its effects on a surrounding environment which classical physics explains. The fundamental reason why these forces affect matter is what quantum physics tries to explain. The following experiments will prove that there are at least two or a combination of two methods that cause a vacuum polarization. A slight coherence of the vacuum polarity of a spinning body will interact with the vacuum energy that will alter the inertial properties of that body. A gyroscope is a particular rotating object which possesses some unusual properties called angular momentum. Conservation of angular momentum ensures that the axle of the gyroscope does not change its direction once it's spinning. Another characteristic exhibited by the gyroscope is precession. If the axle of the gyroscope is forcibly turned, then it will move in a direction at right angles to the direction in which the turning force is applied.
earth and the rotation combined influence in a likewise manner the direction that water and ocean currents swirl, following the earth's rotation. The following object, a scaled down model of Noah's Ark, spins as one would expect. The spinning in the opposite direction causes the arc to vibrate violently and redirect its motion in its anti-clockwise rotation. The ionic latus of a spinning body will interact with the vacuum energy causing a slight coherence which would alter the inertial properties of that body. This occurs because vacuum energy itself curves space-time.
How do we run the program? Well, the R key has the word run on it. If I press the R key now, you'll see that basic gives me